I lost the only son I had. I don't have any more children. That was my son. That was it. Parents mourning the loss of their son who was shot and left for dead have words for the person responsible. And take a look at this. Some parts of the Lone Star State look like a winter wonderland today. There was even some snow mixed in with rain in parts of Bear County. Meteorologist Katie Blake will have a recap and a look at this week's forecast coming up in just a bit. But first, it is the highest number of COVID-19 cases Bear County has ever seen in a single day. Tonight, Metro Health reporting 3,002 new cases. Yeah, over the last seven days, Bear County has seen nearly 12,000 new cases. The seven-day moving average is now 1,694. 70 backlog cases also reported tonight. Our confirmed total cases now 133,519. 31 people died this week, and with the 55 backlog deaths, the death toll now sits at 1,648. As for the hospitalization rate, 1,407 people remain in the hospital. That's up eight, with 395 in the ICU and 229 on ventilators. And on this record-breaking day, we have cell phones to thank for capturing just how many people might have attended a super spreader event at Cowboys Dance Hall last night. Take a look. Shoulder to shoulder, many seen not wearing a mask. People packed the venue to see a live performance from country music star Cody Johnson. At a time when San Antonio has seen a sharp rise in case numbers and hospitalizations since the holiday season, viewers we heard from today found last night's mass gathering concerning, to say the least. We reached out multiple times today to Cowboys Dance Hall for comment on the event, but we've not heard back. Cowboys Dance Hall was cited several times by the city last year for violating its public health emergency declaration. Many of those citations were for not enforcing social distancing. Well, it's a rumor we've heard floating around today. Were San Antonio City Council members allowed to pre-register people for the mass vaccination event at the Alamo Dome ahead of yesterday's 9 a.m. start time? We reached out for the city for an answer to that. We found out it's simply not true. In a statement to case out, the city's assistant director of public affairs, Laura Mays, said there is no truth to those rumors. All 9,000 appointments were open to everyone through the web form and 311 at 9 a.m., end quote. Many people we heard from were upset yesterday when the 9,000 available slots filled up within six minutes of registration opening. However, Assistant City Manager Dr. Colleen Bridger says more doses are coming. It's just going to take a little bit of time. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg and Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf recognized the high demand for the COVID-19 vaccine here in Bear County, leading to them to request more doses from Governor Greg Abbott. In a letter penned to the governor Saturday, it said in part, quote, to date, 26,000 appointments at mass vaccination sites have been filled rapidly without significant issues other than the lack of enough doses to uh, doses of the vaccine to meet the demand, end quote. The governor has yet to respond to the letter. On Sunday, the Texas Department of State Health Services announced Bear County would get another 9,000 doses. Looking ahead, there are still a few slots available for the COVID-19 vaccine distribution on the south side. Councilwoman Rebecca Villagran posted today about the limited availability on social media. She announced registration was full at the west side distribution site, the Alicia Trevino Lopez Senior Center. The south side location is at the Elvira Cisneros Senior Community Center on 517 Southwest Military Drive. To register, you have to call the number on your screen. That's 833 968-1745. The phone line will be open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. For details to see if you're eligible, head to our website, ksat.com. And to help residents get their COVID-19 vaccines, VIA is offering complimentary rides to anyone traveling to or from an appointment at the city and county-sponsored vaccination sites. Locations like the Alamo Dome and Wonderland of the Americas Mall. This offer includes regular bus, VIA Link, and VIA Trans services. Riders just have to present their appointment registration on paper or by phone or their COVID-19 shot record on the day of their appointment. In other news tonight, a mother and father heartbroken their son will never come home again. 51 year old Dietrich Harrington Jr. was shot multiple times on the east side on Monday. He later died at a hospital. The night team's Jaffney Gray spoke to his parents who are now left looking for justice. He was handsome until the day he died. That's my baby. This was 51-year-old Dietrich Harrington Jr. His parents, Dietrich Harrington Sr. and Shelley Harrington, say he was a child of God and that he was a social butterfly. They loved him. 
It didn't seem like he had an enemy in the world. Sadly, he would come face to face with an unknown enemy Monday night at the intersection of Ferris Avenue and Beulah Street. The last time that I saw him, he embraced me and he hugged me. And he said, I'll see you later. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. San Antonio police say they got a call of gunshots fired and a man in the street. When they arrived, they found Dietrich Jr. with multiple gunshots to his chest. We were both hurt. Mm -hmm. And it's something that this, I can't really explain to you. His father broke the news to his work family at IHOP, where he loved his job as a cook. I said, Dietrich Jr. will not be returning to work. He was killed, and she dropped the phone. Police say there are no suspects, no witnesses, and no motive at this time. But as the family holds on to memories of their son, they're holding on to faith that justice will be served. He will come in the room and, and give me a kiss. Every, every morning he would do that before he go to work. And I'm going to miss that kiss also. Jaffany Gray, KSAT 12 News. Developing overnight, San Antonio police looking for any leads to help them arrest the suspects involved in a stabbing on the north side. The incident happened at the Mango Sports Club on General Kruger Boulevard. Police say an altercation moved from inside the club into the parking lot. Later, police were called out to a stabbing just up the street from the club on Blanco Road. That's where police found the two victims, both with life-threatening injuries. They were taken to University Hospital. So far, no arrests have been made. And just about an hour later, five miles north of that stabbing, SAPD responded to another at the Icon Apartments located in the 1500 block of Patricia Street. When officers arrived at that scene, they had to search for the victim. He was eventually found under a stairwell with a stab wound to his abdomen and shoulder. The victim was taken to University Hospital in serious condition. So far, no arrests have been made. Law enforcement responds to calls every day where children have to be removed from parents or guardians. While officers investigate drugs, violence, or crashes, children at the scene are isolated and terrified. So a young philanthropist, a local police department, and a state organization have teamed up to offer comfort to those children. Domestic violence or drug calls, emergency CPS removals, even DWI crashes. So the officers will be, of course, the first person there. And of course, we try to remove the kids as soon as possible so we can separate everybody. The children are sitting in the back of a police car with nothing to do, lights are on, they see their parents taken away. It's a traumatic experience. Tim Allen is the president of the Texas Council of Child Welfare Boards, which keeps track of children in state care and finds ways to fill gaps. He works often with Hunter Beaton, who started the nonprofit Day One Bags when he was just 15 years old, after finding out foster children often carried their belongings in trash bags. You've seen these quality bags in past KSAT stories that Hunter donates to foster kids all over the state. It's supposed to offer a little bit of a less traumatic experience. Now, each bag is being repurposed into a Serenity Activity Pack, or ASAP, kept in the back of Bernie Police Patrol vehicles filled with items to calm kids in crisis. We put a blanket, we put a small toy, uh, age-appropriate activities. I have these teddy bears, I have these little trinkets, these little toys that I can hand out to these children and say, hey, um, you know, it's, it's safe. Um, making sure that we build that trust with them. Bernie police officer Rebecca Foley helped roll out the program just last month and says it's already been successful thanks to some dedicated community involvement. Uh, our job is really to give the bags, but other organizations hear about what we're doing and they're saying, I want to help. Nonprofits and community members of all ages have stepped up to run donation drives for items to place in the ASAP bags. Each item, a symbol to children in crisis that they're acknowledged, supported, and loved. And this is a brand new endeavor, but it's already caught the attention of other communities ready to partner with Day One Bags to support the children in their own towns and counties. If you want to help out, we have the link to the Day One Bags website. Just go to KSAP.com. The current political climate has fueled tensions between people, not only in person, but also online. Media experts say it's important to understand how media works so you can consume the most accurate information. The night team's Jonathan Cotto tells us what those experts say you can do right now to become more media literate. We're all participating in this ecosystem of consuming and creating media messages. 
Renee Hobbs is a professor of communications at University of Rhode Island and says everyone shares a responsibility in creating and consuming accurate information. Hobbs says it can be easy to accept information that might not be true, which is why being media literate is so important. Right now, the environment is full of inaccurate information, uh, lies, falsehoods, stuff that really gets our gets under our skin, stuff that um, makes us angry or makes us have strong emotions and and motivates us to want to share it. Media literacy is defined as the ability to access, analyze and evaluate media in various forms. Communications professor and author Sue Ellen Christian from Western Michigan University says there are easy changes you can make right now to become more media literate. One of the things is to count the number of sources. Look for other sources saying the same thing. Are other news outlets or other sources of trusted information also um, spreading this information so it's not just a fringe social media website or it's not just a string of tweets or social media posts that don't have verification. Both experts suggest trusting your instincts. Pause, analyze, and don't share until you've done your own research. Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. And of course, here at KSAT, we have a series called The Trust Index. It is an initiative focused on combating misinformation and verifying claims that could be misleading or false. To see some of the stories we've already covered or to submit your own story, head over to our website at ksat.com slash trustindex. Outside with live cam, 36 degrees and kind of hard to tell from this uh, view of live cam, but it is still cloudy out there. Uh, precipitation has been stopped for several hours now, but we're left with plenty of cloud cover and that has kept temperatures from moving very much this afternoon and this evening. We've been in the mid to upper 30s all day and still sitting there tonight. 36 at the airport north winds just about eight miles per hour. We should see a little bit of clearing tonight, so by tomorrow morning, a mix of sun and some clouds, more clouds than sun though, and that will allow our temperatures to fall down to near freezing here in San Antonio, maybe some upper 20s in the hill country. We've gotten a couple of questions about should I be concerned about six spots on the roads tomorrow morning? We'll talk about that. Get you ready to head out the door tomorrow coming up in the full forecast. Still to come on the night beat, the black box has been found from the Indonesian airliner crash along with human remains. What we can expect next from the investigation. Plus, it's a dance style that came to life at historical black colleges and universities, and now it's coming here to San Antonio. How a local woman is using majorette dancing to inspire young girls. And there are only 10 days left in the president's term, but the House is pushing forward to start the impeachment process again. What this could mean for the nation and what we can expect in the coming days. That's next. Tonight, President Donald Trump could be facing impeachment for a second time. House Democrats are preparing to introduce a resolution tomorrow accusing the president of willfully inciting violence against the government. ABC's Faith Abube has the latest from Washington. In the wake of last week's deadly riot at the U.S. Capitol, President Trump is facing impeachment again. We're going to the Capitol, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Democrats are demanding he be held accountable, drafting a single article of impeachment charging the president with incitement of insurrection. At least 200 lawmakers support the resolution, but so far, not a single Republican has publicly signed on. Every minute and every hour that he is in office represents a clear and present danger, not just to uh, the United States Congress, but frankly to the country. The latest ABC News Ipsos poll finds a majority of Americans want Trump removed from office, but only 13 percent of Republicans support removal. I think the best thing would, for the country to heal would be for him to resign. The next best thing is the 25th Amendment. Seven GOP lawmakers who voted to certify the election for Joe Biden sending this letter to the president-elect, asking him to stop impeachment from moving forward, writing it is as unnecessary as it is inflammatory. I hope the Democrats don't go down this road. I do not see how that unifies the country. Senator Pat Toomey joined fellow Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski in calling for the president's resignation. The best path forward, the best way to get this person in the rearview mirror uh, for us. Uh, that could happen immediately. As the investigation continues, authorities announcing more arrests. 
Eric Gavilik Munchell of Tennessee allegedly seen with zip ties inside the Senate chamber. And Cleveland Grover Meredith Jr. accused of bringing an assault rifle to D.C. and threatening to kill House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. The FBI is now working to determine if Wednesday's assault was pre-planned by multiple actors. Senior officials telling ABC News they were organized, coordinated and had leadership, communication equipment and paramilitary uniforms. Additionally, a senior official tells ABC News there is a very serious national security concern for domestic terrorism during the inauguration. Faith Abube, ABC News, Washington. So I have some family members and friends over in Tyler in East Texas, yeah. and it's winter wonderland over mm -hmm. there. I mean, it was still going earlier in our show. I'm we got, still getting pictures. We got just a taste of it around just here. I didn't see any it. of my house, but lots of pictures came yeah. in today. Clearly, some people around here did see some of the white mm -hmm. stuff. Yes, yeah, so a little bit, mainly up in the hill country, but I mean, it missed us by that much. The Austin area got measurable snowfall and then points north of that up into central Texas, Waco. Even like Courtney was saying, East Texas, they saw some big time snow, especially by Texas standards today. Here locally, uh, not so much. There, there was some, some nice uh, sights and some pictures up in the hill country. I, I want to look ahead, though, to tomorrow morning. The precipitation is done, and in many places it has been done for several hours. So overnight, we'll see our temperatures fall down for a lot of us to near freezing, even a few degrees below that through early tomorrow morning. So I've seen a couple of questions on social media uh, wondering about the morning commute tomorrow. If you've got to get out, I've seen a couple of questions. Um, should we be concerned about the roadways or anything like that. I've been keeping an eye on the Drive Texas site tonight. I haven't seen any issues as far as weather goes in our area. There are a lot of weather alerts and issues up closer to Austin and then I-35 and then in the far northern hill country, there's Fredericksburg. There's Kerrville and here's San Antonio. Obviously, we've got some construction. So as far as Drive Texas goes, I'm not seeing any issues. And I'm not anticipating slick spots tomorrow, um, especially in closer to San Antonio and Bear County. The reason for that moisture has been done. Precipitation has been done for several hours. So the ground has had a little bit of time to dry up. Also here in San Antonio, we're not looking at a prolonged time uh, at or below freezing. So I expect the roadways to be just fine. Nonetheless, check in with our traffic guru, Samuel King, tomorrow morning and the Good Morning San Antonio team. They get started uh, dark and early at 4.30 a.m., but they will have the very latest info for you as far as the roads go. But I'm not overly concerned about issues tomorrow morning. A quick look back at radar today. Parts of the Hill Country did see rain very, very early today before that changeover to snow happened. And we did have some fairly healthy snowfall in the northern tier of the hill country over to Austin. Here are a couple of observed snowfall totals from today via our friends at the National Weather Service in New Braunfels. Uh, did look like we had a report of one inch of snow as far south as Bernie, closer to a half inch Canyon Lake. And then look at some of these totals as you got up closer to the Austin area, just northeast of Austin, four and a half inches of slow uh, snow, excuse me. And then Leander and Williamson County there north of Travis County, six inches of snow today. Again, those higher totals just just off to our north, but we did have a couple of snowfall reports down as far south as 1604 and then over east of Seguin near I-10. But if you want to kind of draw a hard line, it seems like that air that was cold enough to support snow stopped just kind of right along the I-10 corridor today. Outside now still cloudy, 36 degrees. North winds at 8 miles per hour. It's cold out there. 37 in Gonzales, 37 in Uvalde as well, and dropping down to freezing now uh, in Rock Springs. We've got some nice dry air in place, so humidity will be low for a few days. And as far as the wind goes at this hour, out of the north, about 5 to 15 miles per hour. So it definitely was gusty at times today. Winds are starting to relax. They'll be about 5 to 15 miles per hour overnight through early tomorrow morning. A Doppler radar is very quiet here, but look, this is the storm system from earlier today. It has booked it into East Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, there is some very heavy snow falling in northern Louisiana, working into Mississippi, the Jackson area there. I'm seeing some pictures come in on Twitter. They are getting in on that snow action as well. Again, that snow action that was kind of just off to our north today, just out of reach. Storm system that brought all that snow and rain to Texas today continues to move out. We'll see mostly cloudy skies tonight. I also think mostly cloudy skies in the morning, but by tomorrow afternoon, we'll start to see more and more sunshine. Even with the sun, not going to be warm at all tomorrow. We're only looking at high temperatures in the mid to upper 40s, but don't worry. We'll be back to 60s and even close to 70 uh, in the next few days. Pretty quiet weather coming up this week, guys.
and you can really appreciate a 70 degree day with sun after yesterday. It is absolutely the best part about living in South Texas. Yes, it is. You can keep your snow. We'll be right back with a look at instant replay coming up next. The NFL playoffs have kicked off and wild card weekend gave us a few wild surprises with more of what's on instant replay tonight. Let's check in with our Greg Simmons. And congratulations to Cleveland. A little early, but yeah, I think they sealed the it right now. Yet. All right. <laughs> and this first go for four in a row tonight on the road to Minnesota coming up tonight on a brand new edition of instant replay. Total fabrication. <laughs> I've gotten on anybody who's Tony Parker. Since Tony Parker, I haven't said a word to anybody. I've been like a lamb. <laughs> Ever since Pop lit into his team and shoot around before facing the Clippers in L.A., the Spurs ended their four-game losing streak with a three-game win streak. Can they make it four in a row tonight in Minnesota after an overtime victory last night against the same T-Wolves? we got all the highlights for you. Play action pass. Breeze stays in the pocket. Uh -oh. Dumps it off. Latavius Murray has some space in front. Makes a man miss. And he's into the end zone. There's the slide. <laughs> yes, we had a wild card weekend, but we also had the Kids Network Nickelodeon putting their own twist on the Bears of the Saints game. Baltimore finally wins a playoff game. The Buffalo Bills get their first playoff win in 25 years. Some of the shocking results in the first week of the NFL playoffs. I have all the highlights from today's triple header as well. And the Crimson Tide and Buckeyes are in South Florida. We'll get you ready for the college football playoff national championship tomorrow between number one ranked Alabama and surprise team number three Ohio State. All that plus, do you believe the Houston Texans can repair their fractured relationship with quarterback Deshaun Watson or will he be treated? Tonight, you decide. Instant Replay is live and it's after the night. We're getting more information on why he is so angry. It is a mess in Houston. It is. Thank you, Greg. Mm -hmm. We'll see you again in a little bit. We'll see you on the other side of this break. Investigators now looking into the contents of two black boxes discovered today from the Indian Indonesian passenger jet crash. 62 people were on board when it crashed into the ocean. Rescuers found the cockpit voice recorder and flight data recorder more than 600 feet from the crash site. Human remains and parts of the plane were also found today. Flight tracking data shows the Boeing 737 plane crashed just four minutes into the flight, dropping 10,000 feet in less than a minute. Now to some coronavirus news with cases of COVID-19 continuing to spike out of control across the country. The need to get people vaccinated is growing more and more urgent. Right now, the U.S. is surpassing more than 22 million confirmed cases and more than 373,000 lives lost. Minnesota, now the ninth state to confirm cases of that highly contagious U.K. strain of the virus. Arizona now with the world's highest infection rate per capita. Meanwhile, cases continue to surge in California, the state deploying 88 refrigerator trucks to use as makeshift morgues, mostly in hard hit Los Angeles County. The National Guard is now in L.A. to assist staff at overcrowded hospitals. The state of Nevada has been hit hard by the pandemic, both in cases and economically. Right now, a Nevada company is working on a way to track those who receive the COVID-19 vaccine. And the technology to do the tracking is something already used during the pandemic. Take a look. Welcome. Your temperature is normal. Thank you. You may have seen devices like these. Stand closer, that please. use thermal screening. Temperature is normal. To ensure you don't have a fever upon entering. Wear a mask, please. But have you ever considered that these same machines could also be used to do this? Depending on the policy of any facility, um, if they require a vaccine, all someone would have to do is either hold up their card, uh, their vaccine card, this machine can check it and verify right away if someone is up to date. Monitoring your vaccine status in a contactless way. It's a vision these Las Vegas-based tech innovators have for public gathering entry once widespread vaccinations are rolled out. Just like an ID card uh, that you can scan with your phone, like a QR tag, these cameras have the ability to scan a QR code. A QR code of our very own could be in our futures, just like those you use to pull up a menu on your phones in restaurants. What we do know is the DOD is going to issue a card to every person that receives the vaccine. There's also going to be a digital record um, from the state, and that should be accessible for you know, computer software companies to be able to pull that information. Companies like theirs, eConnect. The Las Vegas native says his company's eClear software with the vaccination check update could be a game changer for tourism on the Las Vegas Strip. A lot of the people that visit casinos are maybe up there in age, so they may want a certain area that they know everyone that's working in the casino and everyone that's in that area has a vaccine. 
That company hopes by digitizing the entire pre-screening and contact tracing process, they can ensure the well-being of staff and customers, not just in, casino, in casinos, but in assisted living facilities, churches, and well beyond that. Pope Francis's personal doctor has died of complications from COVID-19. That's according to the Vatican's newspaper. 78-year-old Fabrizio Sacorsi was hospitalized in Rome on December 26th for a previous health issue. That's according to the Italian Bishops Conference newspaper. Pope Francis first tapped him to be his personal doctor in 2015. It's not clear when he was last in contact with the Pope. The pontiff says that the Vatican will begin COVID-19 vaccinations next week and that he will be in line to receive the shot. A new year means brand new episodes of our digital program, KSAT Explains. This is a show we launched last year that takes a deep dive into one topic every week. And this Thursday, we'll release the first episode of 2021, and it's all about the toll this pandemic is taking on our mental health. A lot of us were happy to leave the year 2020 behind, but a brand new year doesn't mean a clean slate when it comes to COVID. The pandemic that plagued last year has followed us into the new one. We're all experiencing um, stress to the point of toxic stress. You know, that's that chronic stress that doesn't let up. That stress is leaving very few people unscathed. From recovered COVID patients trying to adjust to life after the trauma of a very serious disease. Anxiety would hit me and, and I would break down for no reason. You know, I would be in the shower and just it would just, just be overcome with emotion. To parents trying to raise children in extraordinary circumstances. They may not understand the situation, but they can understand when you're sad, when you're happy, when you're mad. The stress is mounting for so many people and it's making existing challenges even more difficult. The pandemic circumstances really create the perfect environment for using. As a result of that, we see a lot of um, increases in depression and anxiety. We're seeing a lot of struggling with uh, sobriety and a lot of relapse. Addiction thrives in isolation. Um, so recovery has to be about community. It has to be about engagement. We're still here for each other when times are hard and especially when times get hard. Never underestimate the, the healing power of emotional connection. In this episode of KSAT Explains, we're taking a look at the effect this pandemic has had on all of our mental well-being, the risk of not handling the stress in a healthy way, and what we can do to take care of ourselves in 2021. Another look outside with live cam. Okay, I like this vantage point. Looks like we've got a little bit of moisture on the camera lens here. Um, not seeing a whole lot showing up on radar, but I did get a report from one of our great KSAT viewers. She called in and said she's got a little bit of drizzle on the north side of San Antonio near Perrin Vital. So something to consider, uh, maybe a little bit of drizzle left over tonight, but on radar, not a whole lot showing up. A little precip here very close to our radar site, but any measurable precipitation uh, that has been done for several hours. And as we head into the overnight, mostly cloudy skies, temperatures gradually falling closer and closer to freezing. A cold start tomorrow morning will set us up for a pretty quiet week weather-wise. We'll take another look at your forecast coming up. Courtney. Thank you, Katie. Well, for some, dancing is a hobby, but for one local woman, it saved her life, and now she's paying it forward. We'll tell you how she's using dance to help a younger generation. Dancing is what changed her life, and now she's using it to change the lives of young girls across the Alamo City. Hadisa Jones is our next feature on What's Up South Texas. Yeah, she shows the night team's Jaffney Gray her moves, as well as the deeper triumphant meaning behind all of it. We do lots of back bends and pop outs and death drops, two touches, very athletic, just 
fun, crazy sport. That athletic, fun, crazy sport is hip-hop majorette dancing. 24-year-old Hadisa Jones decided to bring this historically black college or university-inspired dance to the Alamo City. She created her own team called Prestigious Jewels for girls ages 7 to 18. They're eager. Some of them are shy. Some of them are just excited to be here, and I love it. Growing up in Memphis, Tennessee, in a single-parent household, Hadisa was also shy, but joining her high school majorette team changed her life. It brought me out of my shell, and that's pretty much why I'm doing it today. I want to make sure that other girls in the city are able to get that same feel as well. Working through her ADHD and PTSD, Hadisa became a highly decorated majorette dancer. So I became like the tailback, which is like the important person that kind of does like little extra in the background, and that forced me to like be able to be um, a little bit more outgoing. But her outlet of dance was fueled by hardships. She and her mother are survivors of Hurricane Elvis in 2003. She was six. Basically had a really big tree, oak tree in our yard, and um, it smashed through our house. A lot of other trauma went on during that time of my life um, that led me to just finding a, a place to make me happy. And that was dance for me. Through all of it, her mother battled breast cancer. She died two years ago. She was Hadisa's biggest supporter. After treatments, I would go to dance classes to release my mind and just relieve myself. Um, I would teach classes. And they got my mind off of everything that was going on, and I could just be free in the moment. Now, in memory of her mother, Hadisa has pushed through her battles. I would dance the pain away. I would dance and put that emotion into my dance um, so that instead of holding it in and balling it inside, I'm able to release it in a different manner. She says she hopes she can help other girls like her do the same. That's something that sparkles on What's Up South Texas. No matter how many obstacles are in your way, keep going because you're here for a reason to do it. Japhany Gray, KSAT 12 News. Dancing through the difficult times. Thank you, Japhany. With no new movie releases this weekend, find out who kept the top spot over the weekend as we go over the box office numbers in just a bit. The snow is gone, a distant memory. Now we move on to sunnier, warmer days. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm not mad that it's going to warm up. Me either. Mm -hmm. Not at me all. Either. I moved from Ohio to get away from the snow. <laughs> I know you all are up. excited sometimes, but not me. It cracks me up when he just gets so bummed about the snow. I'm like, didn't you grow up? He's like, yeah, that's why I'm here. Build all Texas. the snowmans. I've seen it all. You all have fun with it. I'll be inside. <laughs> it, was, it was a nice treat for Texas it today. Is. That's it for is. sure. For all of uh, our Aggies out there, I want to show you this picture out of Bryan College Station. I'm sure you've seen a lot of pictures from there. This was the George Bush Library uh, in College Station. Pretty cool site. I love this picture out of Bernie Wildlife, enjoying the, the snowy scenes as well. This was in Spring Branch. We got a little snowman there on the ledge. This was north of Canyon Lake. This is how Texas does snow, am I right? Yeah, and we're gonna end with this one. I just really like the dog in his shoes, bundled up. You gotta keep the fur babies warm as well. Those shoes cracking me up. All right, so our weather service office today put out a list of some of the observed snowfall totals today. Uh, I'd love for you to check in with Mike in the morning, Justin tomorrow as well, uh, because we'll likely have some updated totals here, but I grabbed a few from um, some of our counties in the area. Uh, Canyon Lake, half an inch of snow reported, but in Bernie, closer to an inch of snow. Um, likely we had some higher totals near the Canyon Lake area. And then as you got north of Canyon Lake and Hayes County there, the totals really started to pick up Cypress Mill. That's in northern Blanco County, 1.4 inches of snow just northeast of Austin, four and a half inches. And then Leander, that's in Williamson County, uh, Williamson County, excuse me, just north of Travis County, six inches of snow reported there today. So we did have some snowfall across the area. We also had some rainfall uh, even up in portions of the hill country before the transition to snow. But here are some of the observed rainfall totals uh, from today. We didn't do too shabby. Uh, the only kicker here is is that areas west of 35 are in the most extreme or kind of dire drought conditions at this time. 
and that's where rainfall totals were lowest. A lot of the rain really filled in along and east of I-35, but the airport we picked up eight tenths of an inch, even eight tenths of an inch out near Castroville, uh, up near Canyon Lake, very close to an inch of rain there, and then New Braunfels, a little bit more than an inch of rain, so not too shabby. We'll take what we can get at this point. Uh, 35 low temperature today, 49 was the high. That was very, very early this morning before uh, the rain and clouds moved on. And so kind of an upside down day for us here. Uh, this was today's pollen count. Something I just want to point out kind of maybe to prepare you for tomorrow with all the moisture. We could see mold either stay moderate or jump up a little bit, but hopefully today's rain helped to wash out some of the mountain cedar. So there's our storm system. It has made a lot of eastward progress tonight. It is now pushing some big time snow into northern portions of Louisiana and even into northern Mississippi as well. This dark blue color. Those are some intense bursts of snow across parts of Louisiana and Mississippi. So that system moving away from Texas and will be left with very quiet weather in its wake for the next couple of days. I want to show Doppler radar again. Our radar site is up near New Braunfels and we are picking up on some really, really light precip moving in from the north and we did have a viewer report of some light drizzle just north of uh, downtown near the Perrin Bidal area. So I can't rule out that there's a little bit of drizzle here in there, but any measurable precipitation is gone. And generally speaking, uh, we will be rain free through the overnight hours. We'll also start to see some gradual clearing tonight. I still think we'll hold on to a decent amount of cloud cover, uh, but we should still see our temperatures be allowed to fall down to near freezing, maybe even a few degrees below freezing through early tomorrow morning. So definitely bundle up if you've got to head out early. Gradual clearing into tomorrow afternoon. We will see some sun tomorrow. That'll be pretty nice, but it is going to stay on the cold side all day. We're only going to warm into the upper 40s, some spots in the low 50s tomorrow. So keep that jacket with you uh, throughout the day on Monday because all around just a cold day tomorrow. Looking ahead to this week, pretty quiet weather. Some additional clouds hang around into Tuesday. We'll have a dry front work in late Thursday, early Friday. All that really does for us uh, is keep our humidity low heading into the start of next weekend. Guys, no more snow, man, Tim. Not a snow. I mean, I'm not a snow hater. I just, you know, <laughs> I've, I've had enough of it. We'll be right back. What was that? The sexual thriller Fatal stayed in fifth place, picking up another $670,000. That lightning, it hit those markers and it took us somewhere. $1.1 million kept Mila Jovovich and Monster Hunter in fourth place. So they pay you to tell stories. I ain't never heard of that as a thing a man can do. At number three, Tom Hanks and News of the World with $1.2 million. My name's Eep. We get stuck. It's news. And we're the world's first family. The Crudes, A New Age, took second place, drawing $1.8 million. The animated sequel has made $36.9 million in domestic box office. I will need you. You know what you need to do. Wonder Woman 1984 stayed atop the chart for a third straight weekend, but fell another 45%. $3 million on the weekend gave the sequel a domestic total of $32.6 million. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. What angered Deshaun Watson even more about the Houston Texans hiring of a new general manager? We are finding that out today. And did the Dallas Cowboys do the right thing, firing two of their defensive coaches following their 6-10 and 10 finish? With more on what's an instant replay, let's see what Greg Simmons has to say. And that's a big debate because they didn't have a chance really to install their defense due to all the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're bringing back Know Your Foe to get you ready for this week's set of challenges for our San Antonio Spurs. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. Yeah, I think each year is a new year. We're, we're starting from scratch, and I think the most important thing for us is just to speak specifically to Deshaun. We are getting more information tonight on just why Texans quarterback Deshaun Watson is even more angry now at team owner Cal McNair's decision to hire Nick Casario as their new general manager. And did the Cowboys do the right thing in firing two of their top defensive coaches following the season challenged by the COVID-19 pandemic? The sports guys are back tonight with their opinions. On my signing, it was such a surreal moment, you know. Um, it was crazy because it's like, wow, like all of my hard work has finally like paid off. 
Our, San, our Larry Ramirez, by the way, with a story tonight of a San Antonio teenager who's Baylor bound in volleyball. And we're bringing back the popular segment. Know your vote to get you ready for what the Spurs have to face this week following their game tonight against the Minnesota Timberwolves. All that plus, we introduce you to a new segment we're calling Insta Repost. Instant Replay is live and it is next. Plenty to talk about tonight. I have to look forward to the Insta Post. You got it. Thanks, New Greg. segments all the time. We love them. New year, new segment. <laughs> we'll be right back.